Hello and welcome to U.S. News and World Report. I'm Simon Owens and here with me is Temple Grandin, a professor of animal science at Colorado State University and author of the new book, The Autistic Brain, Thinking Across the Spectrum. Welcome, Temple. It's great to be here. Uh, now, just to kind of uh, to start with, you, you talk a lot about how difficult it can be in some instances to diagnose cases of autism. Uh, in fact, you detail how your mother took you to a neurologist uh, when you were very young who diagnosed you with brain damage. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how your, uh, your life might have been different if you were born just a few years later? Well, I, when I first, uh, you know, I sort of figured out the cluster of symptoms that is autism, I, they thought it was all psychologically caused. That's now proven to be wrong. Now, over the decades, the, uh, the definition of autism keeps changing. In my book, The Autistic Brain, I have a whole chapter where we go through the history of the diagnosis. Basically, the core criteria in autism is being socially awkward, and um, autism varies from, you know, half the people in Silicon Valley to uh, somebody that's very severe that's going to remain nonverbal and uh, have to live in a supervised living situation. It's a very big spectrum. Mm -hmm. And speaking of the autistic brain, in your book you talk about uh, that while scientists have found some similarities between the brains of those with autism, most autistic brains look rather normal, and even when there are abnormalities, it's difficult to predict what effects they'll have, if any. Um, what will it take before we, we can more concretely identify the parts of the brain that are definitely changed by autism? Well, the one thing that seems to be pretty universal across the people that are verbal are the uh, problems in the circuits for face recognition and for recognizing emotion on faces. Other things tend to be much more variable. Sensory problems, touch sensitivity, visual sensitivity, um, auditory sensitivity. Um, the, the, I have a lot of my brain scans are in the autistic brain. Uh, I've got some big visual circuits in there. But I want to emphasize that other people on the spectrum don't have that. You see, like I'm a, um, a visual thinker. Uh, another person might be a mathematical thinker who's good at computer programming. Another person, a word thinker. One thing that does tend to be common across the spectrum is uneven skills. Good at one thing in school and bad at something else. And we need to be doing a whole lot more on building up on the kid's area of strength. And for me, that was art, and it was always encouraged. And uh, let's say we were able to actually find several parts of the brain that will give us biological clues as to whether a child will develop autism. Um, how would that better enable us to, um, I guess, address it earlier on? Well, it's possible to uh, diagnose kids at risk for autism or other developmental problems uh, very, very early. Uh, these are the babies that don't do uh, joint attention, the baby that may have problems with uh, getting sensually overstimulated. And all the research is very clear. You don't want to let these kids just sit rocking, and, and you got to work with them. A lot of one-on-one -on -one teaching, a lot of turn-taking games, a lot of ABA, which is simply called Applied Behavior Analysis type of stuff but you got to work with these kids. And I was in a really good program by the time I was two and a half years old, or I could have ended up in an institution. Mm -hmm. and, and you say in your book that there's not much research that's being done into the sensory problems people with autism have, uh, kind of like sensitivity to loud sounds and bright lights. Uh, you mentioned that you, you yourself have some sensitivity to loud sounds, uh, and that the autistic are in some ways living in an alternate reality because of these sensory issues. Why do you, th why do you think that scientists are avoiding this research? I think it's sometimes hard for people to understand a sensory reality that's different. The other problem is the sensory problems are so variable. One kid will have sound sensitivity. Another kid has touch sensitivity. Another kid has visual sensitivity. They can be extremely variable. So in order to study sensory problems, we need to be um, separating them out into the category of the type of sensory problem that the person has. Mm -hmm. and, and, and to me, it's one, it needs to be one of the top areas of research because they can be a nuisance, but they can. But for some individuals, sensory problems are very, very debilitating. They cannot stand normal environments, um, you know, like loud, noisy restaurants and football games and places like that. Mm -hmm. and, and you also said that they avoid it um, because of the subjective nature of, of reporting on sensory problems? Well, and there's ways, there is some studies where they've shown, you know, differences in the brain and uh, see, the thing is, autism diagnosis or an ADHD diagnosis or a dyslexic diagnosis is still based on a behavioral profile of a cluster of symptoms. You know, it's not like getting diagnosed with tuberculosis or maybe you got Lyme disease or West Nile or something like that. It's, it's, di it's diagnosed 
looking at a certain behavioral profile. It is not a precise diagnosis. Mm -hmm. and, and with the growing number of people being diagnosed as being on the autistic spectrum, what is the danger of people becoming what you call in your book label locked? Uh, and that they may start using their label of autism or Asperger's as an excuse for why they shouldn't need to do things. I'm seeing problems with this, especially with the kids that are fully verbal, um, you know, working at grade level in school, not getting challenged to do enough things, not learning basic social skills like how to shake hands, uh, not learning uh, basic work skills and the discipline of doing work, um, how to go shopping. You've got to kind of stretch these kids. My mother had a really good instinct on just how to stretch me, and I'm seeing too many of these kids sitting at home, and they're, they're not learning how to work. Um, you know, I think a lot of these kids, when they're 13 years old, if there was a paper route around, I'd put them on the paper route. There's no paper routes, so they could walk dogs for people because they need to learn that discipline of work that those dogs have to be walked every single day. Uh, I had a lot of jobs when I was a kid. I cleaned horse stalls when I was 15 every single day. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I see, as a journalist, I've seen a lot of schools that have been popping up specifically for training those on the autistic spectrum for the workforce because um, a lot of them say that employers still don't know how to exactly uh, deal with people who are, in a lot of aspects, antisocial. Um, you, you mentioned that half of Silicon Valley is likely on the autism spectrum. Uh, would you say one of the largest challenges facing the autistic today is creating work environments where they can thrive? Well, you know, say out in Silicon Valley, they obviously have a work environment they can thrive because of their programmers. Um, they just got to sit there all day and uh, crank out their code. Um, but the other thing is what employers need to do is just if a person with on the spectrum makes a social mistake, you got to just pull them aside and explain to them what he did wrong. And I can remember my very first design job, um, I criticized some welding and I said it looked like pigeon doo-doo. And uh, the wise old engineer pulled me into his office, shut the door, sat me down, and he says, we got to nip these little cancers before they metastasize. You're going to go up in the cafeteria and apologize to Whitey, that was the name of the welder, about your know, rude comments. Now, I didn't go up and say his welding was beautiful because it wasn't. But I did go up and apologize that I said rude things. And he just pulled me aside and said, no, it's not acceptable to say his welding was like pigeon doo-doo. Mm -hmm. You know, that's an example of a boss correcting a, um, you know, social mistake I had made. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the people I interviewed who taught at one of these schools said that um, a lot of different kinds of disabilities, the employer can actually see the disability um, uh, on the person, and, and the problem with autism is obviously it's not something that you can see, or sometimes you can't even detect it uh, right away in a person, and that's why it's it's much harder for uh, employers to, you know, think differently about how they should be dealing uh, with those who work for them on the autism spectrum. Well, you know, you have to have clear goals. Like when I started writing for the Farmer Ranchman magazine, I knew the deadline was the 15th of the month. I had to do a variety of articles on different things. And it was very clear what I was supposed to do in terms of work. And there's a scene in the HBO movie where my boss slams down the deodorant and says, you stink, use it. That actually happened. The secretaries actually took me out shopping. You, and when social mistakes are made, you just have to explain to them, almost like coaching somebody from a foreign country on how to behave. And you just do it in private. You don't be yelling and screaming. You just explain them what they did wrong. And you can't be subtle. You've just got to say, no, you can't say the welding looks like pigeon doo-doo. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are many adults today who have been diagnosed with high-functioning autism rather late in life. Uh, do you think that their lives would have been much easier if they'd learned much of it, of it much earlier in life? Where a diagnosis with autism can help later in life is, is help them for them to have a relationship with somebody that's uh, not autistic. I've had um, uh, and uh, wives come up to me at the airport and say, well, your book, uh, Thinking in Pictures, that was one of my earlier books, um, I now understand my engineer husband and we didn't have to get a divorce. Okay, mm -hmm. that's helpful. But I get worried on the high end of the spectrum and seeing too many kids much milder than me where they've had no speech delay. When I was a little kid, I was not talking until age four. Uh, that uh, they aren't uh, becoming contributing members of the workforce because they never learn any work skills. They haven't learned how to go in a store and order a hamburger at McDonald's. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Temple, those were all the questions I had. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. Well, thank you so much for having me.